What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on Rich Cooper. He is a YouTuber, an entrepreneur, an author, a coach, an investor, businessman, and a knowledgeable man on all fronts. So welcome to the show, Rich. How are you doing? Thanks, my man. I appreciate you having me on. I'm grateful. No doubt, man. I just realized I, I started my intro there with YouTuber. I don't know if that should be the, the first one up, but I guess... That's, I think that's how uh, most people find me now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair yeah. enough, man. So, Rich, I've done a brief intro there, but for people who aren't familiar with you, tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I guess how I got into the YouTube and the pub, like influencer thing, if that's a thing still, you know, I suppose. Um, I was real busy in uh, the 90s and 2000s running a uh, debt relief business. I was primarily in credit and collections in the 90s and 2000s. I set up my business. Still runs today. It's been around for 20 years. My brother and I basically uh, did a deal where earn out buyout. So I got out of the business. Um, in 2014, that's kind of when I started first uploading videos to YouTube. And the original thought, well, I called the channel Entrepreneurs in Cars. And the thought was really just to interview friends and their success rides and sort of like broadcast some of those uh, struggles, some of the do the work, you know, stories that people had. And then I ran out of, ran out of friends with cool cars pretty quick. So I just sort of filled in episodes with just talks around stuff that I was uh, knowledgeable on. And one day I had a guy in the comments, which, which is, you know, at a time where you still read the comments when you're a relatively small channel, and everybody's still nice to you. And he said, you should do a video on the kind of women that you want to try to avoid inviting into your life. And I did. And that sort of blew up. And it was around the same sort of time in my life. It was it was post-divorce. It was post a few other things that red pilled me where I was kind of diving into this rabbit hole that kind of sucked me into the whole manosphere. Um, I call it the mano swamp now. I'm not a big fan of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I started talking about my experiences and some of the content around that. That seemed to get a lot of traction and attention. And people booked me for private consults. And I built a community around it and a best-selling book and a few other things. And here I am today chatting with Zuby. Awesome, man. Well, there's a lot to get into there. But just before we started recording, we just found out a funny fact about ourselves, which is that we were both actually born in the same city, even though I don't think our accents would betray it. So uh, yeah. that city, for those wondering, is Luton, England. Uh, also happens to be the uh, city where uh, Andrew Tate was born, I guess. Was was Tristan born there as well? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I imagine okay. they both were. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot of lot of Luton boys out there um, who are now traveling all over the world and making our names for ourselves. But tell me a little bit more about uh, about growing up. So are you are you British then, or where are you from? Yeah, I've I've got multiple passports. Uh, okay. British passports, one of the ones that I hold. Um, so I was born there, so I'm a national, you know, I suppose. Um, but I live in Canada. I live in Toronto. It's you know it's been my home for most of my life. Um, probably won't be my home for the rest of my life though. It's, it's not a country that I see going in the right direction. So I've got to figure out a way to uh, spend less time here and not contribute to the ridiculous tax system and the absurd policies. So I've got a uh, young child still that I have, you know, obligations to and responsibilities. But uh, I'm a man of the earth, you know, I suppose I don't uh, I don't identify to any one country at, you know, at this point. I hear that, man. Where was it that you grew up? Did you spend much time in the UK or how long have you been in Canada for? No, not really. I mean, I was yeah. I was born there and I think we moved to Canada. Uh, I was about four-ish or so. I think one of my earliest memories was going to a circus with my cousin here um, around the age of four. But I spent most of my childhood here. You know, I grew up just, you know, in the Toronto suburbs and, uh, you know, the the outskirts, if you will. And, uh, you know, it was a good childhood. I had a lot of fun, you know, great friends. Um Spent a lot of time in uh, motorsports and fast cars and riding, you know, sport bikes and stuff like that. That's that's always been my thing was like speed. Um, yeah. But after my 20s, I spent a good deal of time traveling, too. Yeah. It sounds like you're becoming disillusioned with the with the country. You said that you don't think it's on a on a good path. How have you seen it change over the years of your life? It's changed a great deal. I mean, it. It was a country when I was a kid where it seemed like personal responsibility and accountability was a thing. Ownership was a thing. But I think that's that's the West in general now. It's not just Canada. Canada just happens to be one of the countries that's that's gone full on woke. Um, you know, our prime minister here has some of the most absurd policies, the lockdowns during the um, COVID-19 uh, you know, period were some of the harshest and absurd, in my opinion. 
uh, the tax policies they have here, the way they spend taxpayers' money. They're just not things that I agree with. And one of the things I've seen a lot of my friends do in the last few years was just pick up and leave. Um, mm. And it's sad because it's because it's a really nice country. Um, you know, the uh, nature's beautiful. It's got a lot of opportunity, a lot of potential. But the way the country's being run, monetary policy, uh, government policy, um, you know, the infused wokeness and everything now in the very, very fabric of society. It's it's just a colossal waste of time, resources and effort. And I'm, not, and I'm really not a big fan of, of um, uh, like the victim mindset. Like, I don't like people that 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 enjoy being victims that think that it's a way to operate in life. I don't think it's good for culture. I don't think it's good for society. I don't think it's good for humanity in uh, general. Yeah, it's a big shame. It seems like some of the most beautiful and picturesque parts of the Western world are the ones that are being run into the ground by yeah. bad politics and bad culture, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, in the USA, if you're talking about places like California or um, uh, Oregon, you know, places like that, or Canada as a whole, right? There's, mm -hmm. you, I see so much conversation from people in these places talking about how wonderful they used to be and how beautiful the nature is and how, how much how much love they have for the place itself, but they just have these politicians in power who people do vote for, who are just messing it up. And it seems to be happening all across the Western Anglosphere. I was in Australia a couple months ago, mm. exact same thing. You know, you saw what happened with their lockdowns and their craziness. The people who did that, I mean, they got, they got reelected. Um, yeah. And the same thing happened in the US, same thing happened in Canada. Um, Funnily enough, for all its problems, England doesn't see in, England has gone woke. Don't get me wrong, but mm. actually, it, it hasn't gone quite as nutty as some of these other places. Not yet, anyway. But it just seems like a shame because there's so much. Uh, it, it's like all the things that made the West so great over the centuries and decades. It's like all those values are just being undermined and usurped. Just. All, all at once, like every single thing is just being attacked, whether you're talking about the family unit, whether you're talking about the natural gender dynamics between men and women, whether you're talking about, um, you know, people genuinely embracing diversity and inclusion and equal treatment, not not in the not in the woke sense, but in the in the true sense of just like seeing people as people and not mm -hmm. judging one another off, you know, silly, immutable characteristics and stuff like that. It's all just going backwards, especially over the past decade. What do you think is going on? I, I don't know. I mean, like I've been asked this question a lot on shows and podcasts and interviews. And, uh, you know, you'd like to think there's this evil, maniacal room of of like Dr. Evil's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> figuring out ways to, um, you know, manipulate and run things. And maybe there is, maybe there, there isn't. It could be just a coincidence that that's just the direction that society and culture and humanity wants to take itself. Um, but clearly, like, I always go back to just look how a country votes, you know, for its leaders. If if Canada had a glimmer of hope, you know, for example, then I would have seen uh, a guy like Maxime, Maxime Bernier, you know, voted into uh, parliament and he'd have a seat and have a say. But right now, the only say he has is on places like Twitter and social media. Um, mm -hmm. no, nobody in his party got a vote. His, his party's policies seem to be more about freedom, individuality, sovereignty, personal accountability, uh, less government in your life, less government in your pockets, lower taxation, which you'd think is what people would want, but people don't seem to want that. They don't want freedom. They seem to want free stuff, which is why they vote for wokeness, uh, socialism, inclusivity, all of these made up uh, ease and isms and stuff like that, that uh, sort of drive us in that direction. It's like, you know, it's a shame because you want to do something about it, but you, you know, you really can't. And the solution that I've sort of adopted, which isn't very popular for some people because they say, oh, well, you're just giving up is just just enjoy the decline. You know, you draw a perimeter around yourself and the people that you love and protect them and, you know, offer the best that you can and let them do what they're going to do. There's an us and us versus them notion um, out in society. I think that men have always operated that way throughout history. Uh, there's a book that I really like by Jack Donovan called The Way of Men. And he says, you know, the way of men is the way of the gang. And you have to sort of define your side versus their side. It's not like you do it in an adversarial way, but do you really need to care about what happens over there when you have things to deal with on your inside, on your inner perimeter, right? 
Yeah, it's a fantastic book as well. I read that. I read that several years ago. It, it seems like there's this infantilization and simultaneous feminization of our societies and yeah. cultures and politics, actually. That really seems to be what's going on. I think that's the shift from individuality to collectivism, um, you know, intense push for quote unquote political correctness beyond beyond a reasonable amount, right? We're not just yeah. saying, hey, don't don't cut don't scream racial slurs at people, but you know, people wanting to redefine every single word, wanting to have safe spaces and trigger warnings and everything is offensive and everything is toxic. You know, men men just talking, just us having this conversation, you know, this is some type of unhealthy or dangerous yeah. interaction. It's all wrapped in the safety language. We need to keep everyone safe, safe, safe. It's not about freedom, liberty, responsibility, rights, you know, equality of opportunity. It's no, 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 we need, we need equity. Everyone needs to get the same thing. Um, in fact, we need to silence people and censor people who even dare ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a man acting like a man or a boy acting like a boy is toxic, but at the same time, women should be acting like men. It's like there's, it's, it's just like there's hundreds of these narratives out there all at once, which are kind of hitting the population. And I think it's, I mean, I think it's literally driving people insane. Like, I think people are genuinely becoming mentally ill mm -hmm. and are having all sorts of issues and identity issues and confusion. And some of it doesn't surprise me because identity itself just seems to be under under attack. Like, people don't even know who they are anymore. I think young boys are growing up in the world wondering, I mean, you know, what, what does it even mean to be a boy? What does it even mean to be a man? Uh, women are growing up, you know, the, the question of what a woman even is, mm -hmm. is now is now in question, it's a question yeah. right? It, it's, it's, all, it's all being undermined. So I think there's just a lot of confusion, especially amongst younger people when I, when I talk to them or see them interacting online. And it just seems like they don't really know their, their place in the world. Um, I think if you're a 16 or 17 year old boy or girl in this world right now, it's not that clear what your path in life is supposed to be. It, you know, for all its flaws in the past, it was very, it was always clear. Mm -hmm. It was always clear. Okay, you're a man. This is what you do. You're a woman. This is what you do. And if you do these things, you will, you know, you're almost not guaranteed, but you have a very high probability that you're going to find, uh, you know, you're going to attract a mate and you're going to have a family and it's going to just generally work out. Whereas now it's like there's all these different paths you can take and there's all these mixed signals. And I don't know, it just seems like very, it, it seems very deranging. I'm, I'm quite glad to not be, I don't know, 20 years younger than I am in this world right now. Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day because it always seems like our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation would say things like, well, I grew up in the best generation. and Maybe that was right for them, but I thought about it the other day. Maybe it's my age, you know, at this point, but... I really think that I had one of the best childhoods that I could possibly have, you know, the best experiences at that period of uh, time compared to today. Like I, uh, you know, I feel sorry for some of these kids. Um, you touched on a lot of things there and it's like, I get exactly what you're saying and it's difficult to have these conversations. And it's strange, you know, Zuby, because I've followed you for the last year or two, I think on Twitter, and you're one of the nicest guys when it comes to approaching these conversations from a balanced perspective, logical, um, and people still come at you pretty hard, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not quite as nice as you sometimes on Twitter, yeah. but that's just me. Um, but yeah, there is a general feminization of the West. Uh, it's, it's softening the Western male. There's a lot of things that contribute to it. I mean, you could spend hours talking about what's going on and how that's going on. Um, there, there's everything from estrogenics placed in environmental foods, packaging, and even in tap water, there's estrogen in tap water, uh, to just the way people behave as a result of culture and media and marketing, all that sort of stuff. I mean, I never lived in a time where I've seen so many men want to transition to become women. And to me, that's the ultimate expression of the feminization of culture men wanting to change their actual gender to the other gender. Mm. Um, so it's a bizarre thing to behold, but it's it's a reality of the world that we live in today. That is that is the loudest possible message that young boys and men are hearing today um, is be softer, be kinder, be, be all of these things that r really men aren't. I mean, if you look at boys in their natural habitat, like if you look at a four, five, six-year-old boy, that's about as alpha as you know most <laughs> men ever get today. 
right? Like they'll yeah. like they'll go to the sandbox and pick up a handful of sand and just whip it at somebody for fun because <laughs> you know they want to dominate or whatever. They'll you know they'll be on their bicycle and they'll try like high speed runs at things. Like when we were kids, we used to build ramps and jump and do all these kinds of mm -hmm. weird things. And it's like that's what that's what boys do or or did naturally, you know, to sort of compete and test you know test one another. Um, but that's not encouraged anymore. It's, you know, participation ribbons for everybody. There's no first place, last place. There's, uh, it, you know, we live in strange times, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we, we really do. And it's fascinating you said that because, you know, I'm not a father yet, but I, I'm an uncle of 10 and I'm blessed to have five nephews and five nieces. Wow. And for all the people who think that these gender differences are just socially constructed, like, They're please, not. honestly, ha hang out with some children, <laughs> go, go to a, go to a nursery school, just watch their behavior. Um, the boys and girls are different and oh, totally, different, diff totally different interests <laughs> yeah. and the and the difference is it's not just okay it's good yeah it's this is the thing that we, that's the thing that we've gotten away from it's like people are trying to solve problems that are not problems to begin with right i, <laughs> maybe, I sometimes have <laughs> maybe we have too much peace you know one of the things yeah. i've come to accept and realize about humanity is that we're we're a warring primate you know, we really are. We're, we're very similar to chimpanzees, you know. Chimpanzees will actually go out and wage war on neighboring tribes that might be infringing on their territories. And, you know, I was looking at this um, infographic once, and it basically had, you know, big, big long timeline and a peppered series of dots of wars around the world. And it's recently, like in the last hundred years, you know, essentially, you, you know, setting aside the Second and First World War, we live in one of the most peaceful times in history. And it almost seems like we have easy access to nutrition, easy access to transportation. We have easy access to anything that they didn't have to deal with a thousand years ago. They had real struggles back then. And maybe all this spare time created this. I don't know. It's difficult to put my finger on it, but it seems, it seems clear as day that it's going on. Yeah, you're, you're correct. We, we live in this world of paradoxes. I mean, I would say that the things that seem to be becoming less accessible to people are meaning and purpose mm. and genuine community, right? I mean, loneliness is at an all time high. Uh, people are having fewer children and forming fewer families than yeah. ever before. Mental illness is at an all time high, self harm, suicide, like all these, all these things, obesity. I mean, if you look at the West, the thing that's fascinating is what's happened is, uh, and you, you sort of touched on this, but the majority of the social problems are now a result of excess. Yeah. So in, in most of the world and all throughout human history, the problem was always lack, right? There, mm -hmm. was, there, were just, there wasn't enough to go around. There wasn't enough resources. Uh, you know, there were, there were famines and droughts and pestilence and people didn't have medicine. Women were dying in childbirth, right? It was always, the problem was always lack. Yeah. If you think of all the stuff we're talking about, it's actually the result of so much comfort, so much excess that, I mean, you know, no one in the, no one in the USA is starving. How mm -hmm. many people are eating themselves to death though? Right. That's that's unheard of. Imagine a century ago. Imagine going back even one yeah. century ago and explaining that there are going to be millions of people who are eating so much food that it's killing them. They Could wouldn't you imagine even... putting somebody in a time machine from 10,000 years ago and showing them your video of deadlifting at the world's <laughs> uh, you know, the world record for women's you know, heaviest deadlift and then explaining to them how many views that got mm. and why that happened. They would think the world's gone completely insane. Like if you go to a gym today and you see people going there, picking up things, putting them down, running on a treadmill in one spot <laughs> and showing that to a guy from 10,000 years ago, he'd think that the world's gone completely nuts and want to go back, I would think, right? Yeah. Like wasting calories and, and, and energy doing nothing when they would have been spending their time, you know, making sure they had food and protection and shelter. Do you know what's nutty is um, you're saying 10,000 years. What about 100? 100, 200, yeah. 100, 100 right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, even if you went back 15 years ago, even if you went back 10 years ago, that deadlift video wouldn't make sense to people even in the West. Right. If you went back to say uh, like 2012, 2012, and I showed that video to people, even even lefties, even 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 like liberal people would be like, huh? Like yeah, no one is saying they'd be like, no, no one is saying that men and women are the same. Like no one, what do you mean you identified as a woman? Like what what does that even mean? And you know, I've got family, I've, I've shown this to people in different parts of the world for, you know, I remember when it, when that video was going viral and uh, you know, my family background is originally from Nigeria. 
and obviously they're not <laughs> they're not on board with all this stuff mm. but th but they don't even understand the humor because they don't you have to explain to them that okay well in in my country in the west like there's millions of people who believe that you can just identify say that you're a woman and you are a woman and then they're saying that males can compete with females in sport and you can mm -hmm. like it, it, the hum the humor doesn't land i've shown I've, I've shown some people that video and they're just like okay like they don't they don't see the funny part mm -hmm. they're just like okay you know you you did the lift but what do you mean you identified as a woman what does that what does that mean and yet and it I'm continues like... <laughs> and yet they keep pushing further and further into the insanity it's like oh we got this far let's see if we can go this far you know sort of thing yeah it's nutty man uh so on your channel i mean you you talk a lot about you talk about gender dynamics yeah. a lot mm -hmm. um and you said that one of the things that got you talking about that was uh someone asked you a question on YouTube and you answered it and the video blew up. So let's talk a little bit more about that world. What is it that even got you? I know you don't like the term manosphere, mm -hmm. um, but what, what is it that got you into the sort of red pill way of thinking or just analyzing gender dynamics and going out and commenting on it in public? Yeah, I, I went looking for answers, you know, to be honest with you. It's like, I, you know, I got married, um, you know, late two thousands, um, didn't last for very long. It wasn't what I expected. I thought untying the knot would be simple. It wasn't simple. It was very complex and difficult. And if you're a guy, I learned the deck is stacked up against you. So, um, it's not a simple or easy process as you think it might be, but, um, you know, there was that, there was a lot of scenarios growing up. And even after I got, you know, divorced, I got involved with a woman as well. You know, she was a single mom. She had a couple of kids from a prior marriage and that sort of blew up on itself because, I basically subscribe to a series of comforting lies that I've been told my entire life by culture, media, society, sitcom, TVs, Hollywood, family, religion, all that sort of stuff. And it just didn't work. And me being the guy that I am being accountable and the do your work, you know, sort of guy, I just went looking for answers and I didn't find it anywhere else, but in that underground community of the manosphere or the red pill or whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, there's some good useful information there. Um, I found the men to be, uh, not particularly good at being men or good men. So I've put, I've put some distance between myself and that uh, group now, but there's some useful information, which I was able to apply to my life. I was getting consults book regularly, privately with people about dealing with problems in their life, everything from vetting a potential wife to dealing with a divorce or the struggles with that. Um, so it's an interesting thing because it seems like that is one of the most important struggles that men deal with today. And trust me, they struggle like men today have, have it hard. I think men today, you know, I heard this said somewhere on the internet once, uh, but, uh, men today are getting women half as good as the women that their grandparents got. Like, like your grandfather got a woman twice as good for half the effort. Whereas today you're putting in far more effort for a woman that's, you know, just given herself away to a lot of guys, uh, you know, been irresponsible, you know, for the most part may, may have put off important things in her life to prioritize things that society or, or, or culture, or even this toxic, toxic version of feminism have told them has been important. And it's a lot more difficult for men to sort of navigate their own sexual strategies in the world today because you just can't be a nice guy you just can't be yourself like just like the advice just be yourself is good enough is probably the worst piece of advice that any guy can get because <laughs> women don't select men that are just being themselves like historically men have always competed and mm. uh women choose from the men that compete right like i often say that um women don't care about your struggles they hang out at the finish line and they pick the winner right so uh, that's just the environment that men need to understand they operate in. And that's just a little tiny piece of the puzzle, right? This is, this is a puzzle with hundreds and maybe even thousands of pieces that you've got to understand as a guy. And I found myself needing, you know, a lot of these answers to solve my own problems. And I started talking to other guys. And I'm like, wow, this is really, really common. And they were dealing with very similar struggles. So it just so happens that a lot of the conversations that I had seem seem to be interesting to people on YouTube and it got picked up. And that's why, you know, the channel's got the amount of views that I have and I have a podcast mm -hmm. and a book that I sort of built off the whole thing as well, too. That's cool, man. Well, I think one of the big problems, there's a, there's a lot of problems, but the things often don't get resolved because 
there's this notion that you're you're not allowed to talk about this stuff honestly. It's yeah. very well, they don't it's want you to. No, it's very, I, I don't, yeah, I don't mean you literally can't, but it's it's very actively discouraged for certain things to be discussed openly and honestly. I'm someone who's- Which is, which is interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. women want you to know this stuff, but they don't want you to go out, like they don't want you to be schooled on it. Like they just want you to know mm -hmm. it inherently. It's yes, fascinating, yes. isn't it? Yeah, well, men and women c communicate differently. Um, you know, if you even have like, you know, I've, I've, I'm from a big family, so, you know, I've got mothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, brothers, my dad, and just from my, my own family dynamics and also just all the thousands of people I've met in the world, something that's very obvious and is well known is, you know, men and women do communicate differently, mm -hmm. right? When men are communicating, it tends to be a lot more direct. Yeah. So what I was saying is something that's just a reality is that men and women communicate differently, mm -hmm. right? If men are having a conversation where the goal typically is to communicate information, you don't need to dig multiple levels to try to see what they really mean or what's being communicated and so on. Female communication is a lot more subtle. It's a lot more covert. If they're talking about certain things, they don't necessarily want a solution. Sometimes they just want to be heard out. Mm -hmm. They oftentimes want you to know things that they haven't explicitly told you, but they think that you should be able to into it. And I think those wires often get crossed in the communication between the sexes because men tend to want women to just kind of be more direct, just like, you know, say, mm -hmm. say what it is, say what the problem is, yeah. tell me, kind of tell me what to do, communicate the information. And they're kind of like, no, I shouldn't need to, I shouldn't need to say it. You should just know. Um, there's, there's this, there's this mystery. And I think, you know, men are trying to crack this communication code. I think that's what, what what's led to the rise mm -hmm. of, you know, what people now call the manosphere over the last two decades or so. All the, you know, it started out with just internet forums. Now you've got a lot of stuff on YouTube, you've got yeah. books, et cetera. And um, it's just that constant, it's that constant missed communication. But I think that those conversations are so interesting and important and, and healthy. Um, if people are not allowed to openly discuss the, you know, take, take, take something like marriage. And this is interesting because just the other day on Twitter, um, you know, I very intentionally started a conversation about marriage, you know, pros, cons, risks, concerns that concerns that people have and so on, especially from a male perspective. Um, I was, I, I barely even voiced my own personal views. I just, okay, I'm just, you know, doing the Socratic method, trying to see what people think. And mm -hmm. of course, people sh start sharing their stories, both people who have been, you know, married to their sweetheart for 40 years and had a bunch of children and they're still madly in love to people who have gone through, you know, both men and women who have gone through, you know, bad divorces or who have, you know, been burned and had to go through legal processes and this and this and this. And something I found really interesting is um, some people, not even, not, not just women, but, but some people almost some people were mad at me for having the conversation. That's probably the best way to put it, right? For yeah. not just saying marriage is amazing and every man should just like rush into it and you should just do it for love and whatever. Because people are saying, you know, one question I asked was, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I asked if for a non-religious man, uh, or what did I say? I said, what, what is the best, what is the best, re what's the best secular reason for a young successful man to get married, mm. right? That, that that's the question it's not it's not an offensive question but it, the, the way the way different people reacted to it you know some people just actually answer other people are like you know why why are you asking this or you know that, yeah, the fact this that is you not even ask that question yeah yeah it's audacious you know yeah, and it's, i'm like this, it's an, it's important though that we're talking about hundreds of millions of people it's important yeah it's funny have you read my book i actually haven't yet no there's a, a chapter in the book on why smart men don't marry um We'll come back to marriage in a second. I wanted to talk okay. about the communication styles because you brought up something that I yeah, thought sure. was fascinating that I've noticed trending a lot lately um, because I've really been trying to understand people from their perspective, put myself in their shoes and sort of listen to the way that they communicate over the last six to eight months. And something that I've noticed, and you know, you tell me if, you know, if you've noticed this too, if not, you might start to notice it soon, but you're right. Men and women do generally communicate very differently. But what I've noticed is that men have started to adopt the communication styles that women use. And it usually starts with something like, I feel like. Yeah. So you'll hear women very often start, you know, conversations. 
especially if it's something on a controversial topic. So one of the things that I see that trends a lot is um, a woman's uh, promiscuous past, for example. And women will say things, well, I just feel like my past shouldn't matter because I am who I am and you should just love me for today. And that keeps going through the, I just feel like vortex of ideas sort of stuff. And you can use this with other stuff too. Um, I've seen a lot of guys lately now start their responses or start conversations rather than say, I think, or I, you know, from my experience or studies may say, for example, I see a lot of guys now starting conversations with, well, I feel like, and I think that mirroring behavior is, is something that's been conditioned into men to sort of like, if you behave like what it is that you want to be with, that you like, that you're attracted to, it's sort of the like versus, you know, like the like and like sort of thing. So I've noticed that a lot lately and it's, it's something, it's something that pops up a lot, even in the call in segment of my podcast shows where guys will call in and it's, I'll hear a lot of guys start sentences again with, I feel like, and I'm always now interjecting and okay, was that something that you really feel or is that what you think? Right? So there's that, which I thought is very interesting because when I was a kid, I don't, I don't recall any, you know, you used to walk up to your friends and drop a disparaging comment, right? You call them a name, <laughs> something about their sexual preferences, what they look like, and then you'd sort of carry on from there. You, you can't even do that today. You know, there's mm -hmm. words that have been banned now in society. Um, the R word, you know, for example, I remember mm -hmm. I was on a date, you know, years ago, this is after I got divorced. And I said something like, well, that's, you know, art sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, you can't say that. That word's prohibited now. That's not politically correct. Blah, blah, blah. I have a cousin's friend's it's, sister's uncle who has such an autistic... a, it's such a good it's such a good word too. It's uh, well, such it's a, a it's such a useful, it's a genuinely useful word. Because <laughs> because there isn't there isn't a proper substitute for it. No. Right? No. There, so there's some words where if you lose them, there isn't something that properly encapsulates everything that's meant by it. No, it's I, just that's dumb, but <laughs> excellente good, you know, too. You give it yeah. like an exclamation point. So there's that. Anyway, um, so coming back to the marriage thing. So yeah, marriage today, is it is it worth it? And I think if you're a father, the conversation that you want to have with your daughter is, yeah, it is worth it. It's it's definitely worth it. It's very low risk. It can be high reward, especially if women tune into their biological imperative, which is their hypergamous nature. And all that means is women generally uh, date and marry across and up on the socioeconomic scale. So they tend to find men that are uh, better off than they are. And that's not because they're gold diggers or any of those things. That's that's really just an evolved part of their thinking, their firmware, their DNA. Because if they didn't, you know, if they didn't select a mate a thousand years ago that was competent, capable, could provide, could preside, had resources, could protect the family, it could spell certain death for her and her kids, right? Um, you know, women are very vulnerable when they're pregnant and they've got small children, especially. So it's 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 bred into them um so you can't blame them for that so it's it's rather safe for women to get married today but for guys it's a different proposition right um you expose yourself to inviting the state into your household you expose yourself to being uh used and manipulated through the system extorted treated like tax cattle there's all kinds of things that happen to guys and most like there's no nobody warns you about this it's just get married, take your, you know, your uh, vows uh, till death do us part and sickness and health and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is that's not the experience that most men have in the marriage cycle and especially the divorce cycle because half the people get divorced anyway. The other interesting component, when I was composing my book, I came across a stat that uh, studied the happiness, love and bliss levels of uh, people in long-term relationships. And I think the average period of time was something like eight years, like eight point 8.1 years or something like that. And take a guess how many people after eight years are still describing each other as being in love, Zuby. What do you think after that would be? After eight years? Yeah. Is this married couples? Or just yeah, this is, this is, this is long-term committed relationships. So a mix of married LTRs living together, not living together. 25%? It's uh, 13%. And then 13. when they were asked if you're still in a state of bliss, like obsession with your partner, take a guess what that was. Oh, that'll be like five. It's, I think, two or three percent. It was, it was okay. really low. Yeah. So, like, when you get married, most people that stay married over a long period of time, I don't know that many that are overwhelmingly happy after 20 years. There's a handful. Um, it seems like when they resign themselves to traditional roles in, like, 
traditional gender roles where women have the pink jobs and men have the blue jobs sort of thing and they collaborate and she's a compliment to his life and he's a compliment to her life like he does his job and she does her sort of job those seem to be the ones that work out but it seems like there's a lot of really unhappy long-term relationships that might be stuck in a marriage and they don't leave um you know they're 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 staying there unhappily because the cost of leaving is is too high um Women generally in, initiate most of the divorces. There's incentive to that. So th again, you know, this is a, a puzzle with a thousand pieces to it. And it's very, very complex. And I think that you can have a family. I think that you can be a woman, be with a woman. I think that you can raise those kids together. I don't know that doing it under state advisement or under religious, you know, control is a way to do it. It's, yeah. You know, it's a long I, conversation with that one too. Yeah, it, it's a long conversation, but you know, it's it's a very necessary one. Regardless yeah. of regardless of someone's political, religious, or social views, this is a conversation that is so necessary because you cannot fix a problem or even take steps to fix it if you cannot honestly talk about it and diagnose what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, my audience is, I've got a very big conservative leaning audience, um, mm -hmm. majority religious as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, and I would, by Western standards, I certainly fit into the religious conservative bucket, if you want to put me in that. I don't really like to, you know, b label myself per se, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a religious man, um, and I'm very, and I'm very pro-marriage, and I lean, more, you know, pretty conservative on most things. However, you can still see what is going on, right? Just like, look, look at the numbers, look at, look at the statistics, look at what is going on, listen to what people are saying, look at the millions and millions of uh, situations that have happened. I'm very blessed. My parents have been married for uh, 47 years. Um, they're still very much in love with each other. They're very happy. Um, even with, with my wider family, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, happy marriages, right? So I, I've, I'm in an environment where I'm fortunate to be able to see lots of positive examples of this institution working well, right? Um, I'm also from a Nigerian background. I'm not like totally westernized. Um, I grew up in Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. So mm -hmm. my perspective is not kind of the same as someone who just was born and raised in California or in London or whatever. But I see what's going on. And the thing is, even from the conservative perspective, like all conservatives are you know, very pro pro marriage, you know, pro family, we need to bring back the family unit we need. To, mm -hmm. And if you want to do that seriously, beyond just talking, you have to understand why, why are young men skeptical about marriage now? Why are so many relationships not going the distance? What is what's going on? Because the way it is right now, we're in this bizarre situation where legally and socially, there's one foot in this sort of progressive secular world, and then the other foot in the traditional, more religiously influenced world. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't it doesn't mix well. So if you look at the laws, the laws around, you know, whether it's divorce, alimony, child custody, you know, the way that these things are written and also the way that they work out in practice, it's all based on this sort of like 1950s idea of, you know, mm -hmm. the man is the sole breadwinner. Um, the woman's going to be destitute if, you know, the, if the marriage fails, uh, alimony needs to be paid by the church. It's, it's all based on, you know, a more a sort of more, uh, a, a sort of code of chivalry mm -hmm. almost, right? It's based on that old school world. But then there's also now, you know, you know, complete no fault divorce. And there's just, oh, you know, culturally, oh, you know, girl, if you're not happy, just like go just, right. it, it's so these things don't blend well. It's like you, you, you kind of have to pick one or the other. When I look at the uh, marriages that work very well, it's typically conservative religious framing, right? Conservative religious people, yeah. and they're, they're doing it just by, by the book, gender roles, this is what the man does. This is the, what the woman does. Boom, till death do us apart. We don't really care about the state. This is before God and neither of us are gonna break that. And that works. Um, but this sort of m mix of the two where people are trying to have their cake and eat it too. And you wanna be a you know, strong independent woman, but you also wanna have the husband there, but you don't really need him, but you also, 
I don't know. It, it, it's just, it's not working. And I think unless, <laughs> unless people are willing to talk about it and say, oh, okay, let's talk to these guys in their 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, yeah, but even in their teens. when you start having those conversations, then, you know, the female first primary social order starts to push back and they say things like, so what do you want to do? You, you want us to go back to the 1950s? You want us to go back to a, <laughs> a place in time where, where women were just property and they didn't have independence and they didn't have the ability to go and earn and make money? It's like, all right, here we go. And it's like, you know, they want to take you to this like weird zone that mm. we're never going to go back to, you know, let's, yeah. let's just be honest. But I mean, you know, you were talking about the numbers before when it comes to things like marriage and you, you know, you've got like the religious component, you've got the cultural issues, you've got, you know, well, my family, my extended family and all that family, it works well and we've done it forever. And they've, you know, they've been married and loving all that sort of stuff. But that's, that's an old um, social contract that doesn't really exist today. I mean, one of the, one of the strongest indicators that you're choosing a good, we'll just call it wife stock, you know, like a good mother for your kids, like good wife stock would be a woman that um, hasn't been promiscuous in her past. There's a study out there. I think it's called the Teachman study. And I think it tracks the data. There's one that tracks it up to a dozen past partners. And there's one that ta uh, tracks it up to, I think, 25 or something like that. But either way, the data is conclusive that if, if you get, if you invite a woman into your life as a wife that has been with nobody, she's a virgin, um, she is yours, and that is it, the chances of you getting divorced after eight years is something like 5%. is very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, even after, I think, uh, four partners, four past partners, the, the data starts to drop to like 40, 50, and it you know just gets worse from there. Like mm -hmm. The chance of you getting divorced after... Um, seven or eight years, if she's had four partners is something like 40 or 50% higher than yeah. a woman that's a virgin. And where do you find these women that don't have promiscuous past today? If they've been told for decades through culture and society, you go girl, uh, men and women are equal. If men can be promiscuous, then women can too, without consequence. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you see this all the time on these, uh, shows, these podcasts where these guys sit down with a table full of women and they don't really yep. solve anything or get to any <laughs> answers. All they do is they seem to make an example of, you know, today's modern women and they call them, you know, today's modern women mm -hmm. who just uh, will unapologetically sit there and be like, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't need yep. no man. I'm happy yep. being single. If a guy doesn't want to choose me, I don't care if he doesn't like my past. So you've got this spread where you've got men that are rational, deductive, thinkers that are looking for solutions to their reproductive strategies in their life and, you know, whether or not they want to have a family or not. And some of them are just putting their hands up and just being like, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just not worth competing. I can't compete. Uh, if I do compete, then I put my entire net worth at risk and potentially lose access. Like one of the most devastating things that happens to men that go through divorce and only men that have been through divorce that lost to that game is the whole sales pitch to getting married and have kids is you pass on your name, you pass on your DNA, you leave a legacy behind. And if that can be stolen from you because family law or the state has legislation written into it that's so hostile uh, towards fathers that she can take the kids primarily or even, you know, conclusively and alienate him from his own children while he is robbed at his point of deposit. So his paycheck, let's say, where he's garnished. And it all goes to her and she just uses the money to alienate him from his kids. Like that's a reality for a lot of men today. It's a sad reality because they signed up for, you know, for, for never, never sickness and health till death to his part and all that sort of stuff. And they don't get that at the end of the day. And there's no protective mechanisms there in, in place for men. So men are now saying, well, is it worth it? Should I even do it? You know, what do I do about this? What are potential solutions? There's certain things that you can do to minimize the risk, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, select a partner that doesn't have a whole bunch of red flags. Like one of the more controversial chapters in my book is the 20 red flag chapter. You don't even have to buy the book. You can get it for free if you go to my email list and just opt in. But um, I break down the most obvious red flags that I've seen over the last few years with my experience, the guys that I've consulted, the guys that call in on my podcast. And it's always the same sort of stuff. It's like, this is, this is damage. Like this is, these are bruises. These are these are wounds that women carry that, yes, you can invite them into your life. Yes, you can marry them. A lot of guys do. 
But the chances of you comp complicating your life unnecessarily and putting your wealth, your access to your kids in the future at risk also go up dramatically as well. So you tend to want to avoid those. And then the big argument guys have is, well, you're basically describing a man because if she doesn't have any of those red flags and that's a dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you get the... Um, you know, you get the notion. It's 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 a very difficult conversation. And my granddad never had that conversation. No, you know, he, he never had that problem. There was no social media. There was no OnlyFans. There was no seeking arrangements. There was no you go girl and do whatever you yeah. want. You know, none of that existed. I, I think a lot of people don't even realize how much it's changed in the last 15 to 20 years. Oh, yeah. People really don't. Right. I mean, I, I can even in my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. I, like there's people I can talk to who um, I don't know, even someone who's my I'm 36. Um, but you know, if I talk to, you know, I have friends who got married at 20 or 21, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, wonderful. I think to meet the right person for you that early and to boom, like, good for you. Great. Yeah. Right. Like, I, I think that's actually, I think that's actually the ideal in a perfect world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but not everybody, not everybody does. And not everyone can be expected to, you know, all the people who are pushing, you know, just get married, get, 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 get It's like, well, a lot of people marry the wrong person young and then by 26, they're divorced. So, you yeah. know, it's not great advice for everybody. Um, but when you have these type of conversations, they often don't, yeah, because, because 2005 doesn't seem that long ago, No. but in 2005, there were no smartphones. Nobody really had smartphones <laughs> in 2000, back then. No, the, the iPhone was ex invented in 2006. Yeah. It was released yeah. in 2006, right? So yeah, we, there had were no these, we had these brick phones, these Motorola's yep. that were just yep. massive. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so there were, there was no, so there was no social media. There was mm -hmm. no, uh, no, no Instagram, no, no TikTok, no, this no is the any first of this generation stuff. that's, that's growing up on social media and screens. Yeah. And yeah. we don't know how this is going to unfold. And, and to be honest with you, the, the trajectory, the direction we're going, it's not looking good. No, it's not good at all. I mean, you, you, there's stuff you can measure self-harm, suicidal ideation, yeah. um, depression, anxiety, all these things are just growing well, and they're growing very quickly with how teenagers. many kids today are growing up in a single parent household. I think it's 43%. And because women are still getting most of the custody order, it's generally speaking, you know, children that are being raised by single mothers and getting some access to a father from time to time, or maybe no access if he was a bum or she pushed him out of the kid's life or whatever it happens to be. But you know, there's a lot of children today that don't have access to a father and they keep using this term toxic masculinity. And I don't think that men are inherently toxic or, or bad. I think that there's just masculinity. There's no version of toxic masculinity because mm -hmm. masculinity sure comes in handy when there's a flood or if there's a war, or if there's a fire or the zombie apocalypse comes, you're going to be running behind the guys, you know, with the guns that are big and strong, of course. But, you know, with the absence of, of, uh, men, then you end up with more problems with children, uh, higher rates of teenage pregnancy, higher rates of runaways, higher rates of gang activity, poor grades, higher rates of uh, all kinds of problems, uh, mm -hmm. suicide, suicide attempts. Yeah, poverty um, itself. There's an interesting story that I was told by the South African guy a bunch of years ago at an EO event, and he was talking about these um, African elephants that were um, hunted to near extinction for their ivory tusks. And what ended up happening was um, rhinos were almost uh, as a consequence of them hunting the adult male elephants were almost killed off in that area. And mm -hmm. it wasn't because they were po poaching the rhinos for their uh, tusks or their horns or whatever. It's because young uh, male elephants who didn't have adult males to keep them in check were charging the rhinos and killing them. Yep. And when they, when they reintroduced the adult male elephants and they, and they stopped the uh, poaching, they put measures in place to reduce it, then the rhinos survived. They yes. stopped getting charged by the young male elephants and killed. So, you know, you, you've got to have checks and balances, you know, in society and culture. And I think that if you remove men from the household, then you're, I mean, you're starting to see what's, what's happening as a consequence of that. I mean, again, in no time in history have I seen so many males think that they're women and want to change their gender. Mm -hmm. um that's that's something that's devastating towards fathers i mean i saw this clip the other day i think it was on a dr phil show where a young man oh, came out yeah. dressed as a woman and you could see the pain in his face man yeah yeah i mean there's that story going on right now as we record this with uh that guy who worked with mr beast and he had a wife yeah. wife wife and children and he's just given all that up to quote unquote transition. I saw that this morning, old. you know, he went from an average guy to a well below average woman, you it's know, the very looks strange. And, so and, and this is someone who had a wife and kids. And so, cause 
this is the thing as well. It's it's also the the selfish and narcissistic nature of it all because on some of those things, the people who defend that stuff, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, if that's what makes him happy. And you're does just like, though? okay, well, yeah, number number one does it. It really like, what's doesn't going from on what here? I've seen. Of course you know? not. Of course not. Um, you can't be what you're not. Um, and how are people going to accept you if you don't even accept yourself? Exactly. But but to do this, to, to do this, not even just as a single person, but you've got a wife, you've got children. And I've, I've met people. I've actually met a couple girls who uh, this this happened with their with their boyfriend. I, I met I've met two women now who their previous relationship broke up because their boyfriend went to them one day and said, uh, hey, babe, I actually want to be. Um, I, I want to be a girl. I'm, I've want to be a woman. I'm going to. I'm going to transition, and mm. that's the thing that ended their relationship. Like literally, their boyfriend wanting to become a, a woman. And this is, and if we think about how this whole idea got mainstreamed, it got mainstreamed in 2015 with Caitlyn Jenner, right? Mm -hmm. And one part, <laughs> and one part of that conversation that was never had again was, what about the family, mm -hmm. right? What What's the effect on your wife? on your children and all these, right? Like, yay, wonderful, brave, this is amazing. It's like, mm -hmm. wait, hang on. Imagine your father, your father one day <laughs> just comes and tells, tells your mom yeah. and, and your, your, you and your siblings, hey, um, yeah, you're not, you're not really gonna have a dad anymore. Like, I'm gonna become, and no one, it's like pe people are like, like so selfish that they're not even thinking, okay, what's the, what are the ramifications of this? Cause we can't just pretend, oh, this is, you it's know, so strange, you, man. It's like, you know, we're just meat covered skeletons on a rock <laughs> flying around a atom exploding, whatever the sun is, you know, and there's all these other species on the earth that are the exact same thing. And we're the only ones that think it's a great idea to cut off body parts and <laughs> identify as another gender. It's, it's bizarre, man. Yeah. It's, it's very strange, man. Um, so you have a, you've got a, a son or daughter. son or daughter, daughter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How old is she? Um, I don't get into those details because there's too oh, many sorry. Oh, sorry about that. weirdos online. Oh, but, okay, yeah. okay, okay. No, I'm, I was, I'm curious as to you know the 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 challenges of raising a, a daughter or a son in this in this current yeah, well, climate. Yeah, so that's a good question. So daughters are very different from boys. You know, like I said earlier, I think that the conversations that you want to have around boys would be become confident. You know, develop skills, uh, compete develop strength, combat skills, uh, you know, be a very good problem solver. Like these are the things that I think that men need, to, like men, men become, they're never born, you know, sort of thing. Like boys become men when they do the work and they're, and they're stress tests, you know, they have struggles in life and they persevere past those, you know, sort of thing. I think women are very different. And, you know, the conversations that I have and are starting to have, and we'll have more of it as my daughter gets older are going to be around, you know, you are a thing of beauty on the sexual marketplace. You know, uh, men look at women as beauty objects, right? And women look at men as success objects. It's always been that way. I think the idea that we tell girls to go and put off having families and get degrees and climb the corporate ladder and the whole, you know, you go girl, the patriarchy's like, why should you serve a man at home? And then they end up going to serve a man at work and paying mm -hmm. taxes and, losing out on opportunities to be a mother and raise a family and all those sorts of things. Um, you also want to tell girls to preserve the value in a sense where they don't become promiscuous. Like there's consequences to that, that don't affect men nearly the same way that it affects women. A guy can be with a lot of women and still love his wife and his family and not want to ever leave them. Um, whereas a woman, that's part, that's one of the reasons why, uh, marriages don't last is women tend to have a promiscuous series of party years in their twenties where they sort of go and find themselves and they explore the world and they explore men sort of thing. And if a woman's been with 20 guys or 30 guys or whatever it happens to be, and she gets married and things aren't going her way. Well, if things didn't go her way with those 20 or 30 other relationships, she would just leave and go to the next guy. So what makes you think that you're going to be stickier to her in a marriage because she said some words in front of, you know, some authority or a religion that is supposed to make her stick to you for the rest of her life. It's, you know, you've got to look at the reality of the way that humans operate. And I think that's a consequence of the world that we live in today that you've got to consider when you're talking to boys and girls, you definitely have to have different conversations with boys and girls. Mm.
Yeah, the social context and culture is so incredibly important because that's actually what reinforces and glues everything together. So I think one of the big problems in the West is that now that divorce, um, you know, for, for totally frivolous reasons has been so normalized and it's almost become this expectation that a marriage is not till death do us apart and so on. And that's the kind of that's the context of it all. It creates an even bigger problem because people, men and women, probably women even more, adapt to the the, the climate and the context that they're that they're in. So if you're in a more you know traditional and conservative community where mm -hmm. everyone's on this base and and people are going to work together to make sure this thing holds together and it works, which is what how marriage has always worked. Uh, all around the world most of the time. It's, it's how it still operates in most of the non-Western world, right? It's mm -hmm. it's socially enforced. I remember many years ago when Jordan Peterson enforcement <laughs> said, said yeah. enforcement and, and people people blew their lid at him. Yeah. But what he meant was very obvious. He, was he wasn't talking about laws. He's talking about socially enforced monogamy, having mm -hmm. having parents, having family, uncles, aunts, community, We've people moved so, who- We've so far away from that though at this point, haven't we? Yeah, in the West, it's it's a big problem, you know, and and it's Even, interesting. With oh, sorry, yeah, go go ahead. Yeah, no, I was saying, you know, my my perspective on this and a lot of things is is always a little. I always come at it from a from a little different angle because I've mm -hmm. grown up across this range of different countries and cultures. So, you know, being being born in England, but then living in Saudi Arabia for twenty years, family background originally being from Nigeria and being from a very a very big family. Um, and then also going to an American school up until fifth grade, spending a lot of time in the U.S. and then you know traveling to all these dozens uh, dozens of different countries, you you can clearly see, you know, sometimes people say like, oh, the world is going crazy or the whole world is excellent. Oftentimes it's it's really just the West. Even time sometimes it's even the the Anglosphere, mm -hmm. right? So there can be something that's a norm or that's common in the U.S. or in Canada, but actually globally, it's not the norm. It's not normal. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not the norm at all. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I look at these things with a different context and you can kind of see, okay, why is this thing working over here? And then over here, it's very dysfunctional, right? Or mm -hmm. why is, why is, why is it good with this group? And this is terrible with that group. And there's a lot of clues if you're willing to be, uh, intellectually honest and have conversations and just look into it, you know, kind of dis dispassionately, not getting all emotionally wrapped up in it, but just like a problem solver, just like, okay, what are the factors going into these situations and something that you that you always find is the sort of old school wisdom whether it's from uh, the, the bible or it's from another biblical text or whatever around all these different problems uh there's there's a lot of wisdom there right mm -hmm. people look at it like oh this is just you know this was written thousands of years ago and it's not valid or whatever you know why why do men want virgins men men just want virgins because they're you know they're misogynists and they're sexist and they want to oppress women and it's like well you know, you can look at, like you said, you can pull up studies, <laughs> you, you can pull up data and you can be like, okay, well, look, look we, we've, we've literally got a chart. How do you here. argue with that? And it's like, okay, so maybe, maybe the people back in those days may not have been able to perfectly articulate the reason for certain norms and certain rules It was also very, very ideas, different back but, then too, because we yeah. didn't have things like social media, like men and women use social media very, very differently, don't we? Like men will yes. use a camera and they'll point it outwards to take a picture of their car, <laughs> a landscape. <laughs> women take a picture of themselves. Yeah. You know, they turn the camera around the other way and they take selfies. In every and, country too, in every country. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know, cross-culturally, every country. And, you know, if you give women uh, unlimited access to a screen where other men are on their screens as well and they're showering these women with unlimited validation and attention you're beautiful you go girl so strong and brave it doesn't matter if they're a two or a ten they all hear the same message mm -hmm. you know even a even an average looking woman will be told online that she's amazing and you know with the addition of filters and angles and spanks and all these other you know new technologies and stuff like that you can really goose the system but w women today are have, have so much access to so much more than what we did hundred years ago. It's the same thing with men too. You like men also have the same advantages and the same disadvantages. It's just that social media, I think, uh, is used very, very differently by men and women. It, you know, like women will use it to amplify certain characteristics and, and traits, and men will use it for other. Like OnlyFans wouldn't exist if there wasn't simp's. If there oh, yeah. wasn't a simp economy with men struggling with women, looking for attention and validation from women, 
giving them money for that, it just wouldn't exist. And you have mm -hmm. these women now today who are making fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars a month taking pictures of themselves in ways that you can just go to Google and search for or go to a porn site or something like that now, right? Yeah, it's very weird. I mean, if and if we're talking numbers, then men are a bigger percentage of that problem. Because Absolutely. for every because for every one of those girls, there's hundreds of men who mm -hmm. are paying for that individual to yeah. show them that I, I don't know who all these men are but they're clearly out there otherwise there wouldn't be a th th those figures wouldn't be possible yeah whenever um, i talk about that i always have guys that, that that chime in and they say well you know like when are we going to hold these men accountable and it's like if you have a solution to simping i would like to know what it is because <laughs> i don't know how to solve that problem it's it's rampant like you you're not going to stop guys from simping i don't think yeah it, it's a it's it's a weird time it's a it's a very weird time to be living in um, I think another problem with the technology, and again, I think people who have been, you know, been in long-term relationships, marriages for, let's say 10 plus, 10 plus, certainly 15 plus years don't get is just the, the level of the technological impact on both, on both men and women, yeah. because another thing it does is it creates, um, I would say it's like, a. It creates a sense of artificial options. Maybe that's the best way to put it, mm -hmm. right? So I think from the male perspective, if you're on you know, Instagram, Instagram in particular, but social media in general, and you're just seeing all these women all over the world, all these places, and you know, you're know you interacting with some or whatever, you know, okay, like, I don't know, myself, I have, oof, across social media, I must have around 700 to 800,000 female followers. Right. So you can have this idea of like, oh, there's there's so many options. Right. Or a girl, you know, any cute girl can have 10,000 plus followers on Instagram easily. Yeah, easily. Right. Some of them hundreds of thousands. And so it can have this idea. Oh, I've got all these men and, you know, men are liking and men are simping and they're commenting or whatever. And so it's like, oh, I have all these options right. of a potential boyfriend or a potential husband or whatever not realizing that no like there's a lot of guys who would be you know they, they'll happily sleep with you or you know maybe they'll yeah. date you and not take you seriously or whatever but out of that pool of men what percentage who meet your who meet your bar your female bar are also like taking you seriously enough that they're like oh okay i would actually consider marrying this woman and committing to her and so on so i think there's this paradox of choice Mm -hmm. that can happen on both sides where people think like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I, I never settle, right? That's what I say, you know, you never, never settle, never settle, never settle. And it's like, well, the reality is that people do settle, right? Like if you, yeah. if, if you're picking you one thing, it means you're, yes, yeah, so if you're not, if you're, if you pick one thing, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you order something on the menu, it means you're not eating every single everything it, else that's if on it the tastes menu. really good. It's probably <laughs> not vegan, has a lot of sugar and some fat, I'm sure. <laughs> right which yeah. is okay like i'm a car guy i would love a car that that does a quarter mile in nine seconds but also gets 40 miles to the gallon yep. you can't have those two things in the same place <laughs> at the same time they just don't exist no. um yeah it's a reality yeah it's a reality man so through all this stuff rich man how do you uh how do you keep your head screwed on and and most importantly how do you uh how do you stay i mean i don't know if would you describe yourself as as, as optimistic and joyful? Cause I was going to ask, how do you stay optimistic and joyful? But firstly, is that, do you I feel that you're so. in that I space? Mean, yeah. You know, like if you want to stay joyful in life, I think one of the things you have to make a conscious decision on is to stay away from people that can rob you of your joy. Mm. The unhappy and unlucky, uh, 48 laws of power law, num law number 10, right? Um, you know, if you stay away from, from, from people that can invite chaos or difficulty in your life, you know, if you, you want to stay away from women that have loads of red flags, you want to stay away from people with a victim mindset. You want to stay away from guys that, um, aren't in shape. Like I don't, I'm at the point now where in my men's community, if guys reach the top tier and they don't look like they're combat ready, I'll call them out on it. I'll, you know, I had a guy I was at um, Breckenridge a couple of months ago doing some skiing with some friends. And one of the guys, I called him skinny fat. Right. And he said, and, and <laughs> after that, he's, you know, he, he like, like fat shaming works, you know, like after that, he started to get his diet in order and start working out. It's like, well, you know, I want competent men around me. I want guys mm. that I can rely on. I want guys that are going to test me. I want guys that I can push and guys that will push me. 
Um, I think you have to be very, very uh, protective of your inner circle. You know, we were talking earlier about drawing that perimeter and defining the S versus them sort of equation. And they're it's not like one perimeter. You've got concentric rings, right? It's kind of like rings in a tree. Uh, mm. The people that you love the most and care for the most are in your inner circle, you know, your family, your kids, you know, whatever that happens to be. And those rings sort of go out. Um, and in my men's community, like the guys that I work with a lot, I always want to make sure that if you're going to be on the inner circle and you're invited to the inner circle and you're on the inside, that you're held to standards and you're accountable for a lot of things. You keep away from the guys with a victim mindset. Like, you know, the victim mindset's a loser's mindset. All these people that are victims of rich people, the government, Trump, you know, whoever the enemy happens to be for them at that time. Um, everything from capitalism to racism to transism, to whatever phobias or obias, you know, happen to be trending. Any of those people, you just, you just keep distance from them. And they can exist and they can coexist. It's just, I'm not going to invite you into my life. I don't care what you have to say on social media. I'm not going to respond to you if you leave a derogatory comment somewhere. I just don't care. You know, I started to follow the post and ghost method of social media where I generally don't respond to people. Like I have my settings so that I only get notifications from people that I follow yeah. sort of stuff. So it's like you have to be protective with your time so that they don't invade your um, mindset. They don't poison mm. your mindset. Um, and that's just the reality of the world that we live in. It's, it's, it's something that I understood even as a kid, you know, my dad used to talk about things like used to have this, um, plate and it had a saying on it, something like you can't soar like an Eagle if you surround yourself with turkeys, right? Like this is stuff that was in me even in my teen years. So, mm. you know, you really have to own that stuff and you have to live by it. That's such an interesting quote there because I, I have something that, uh, that I, I have an analogy that I use that it's, it's different, but it's kind of similar. Um, I actually said it's, I did a Q and A on Twitter the other day and someone asked me for, uh, you know, about how they can succeed when the world is going mad and they're surrounded, mm -hmm. it was a young guy, you know, they're surrounded by all this wokeness and all the craziness. And I said, you know, be an eagle, not a pigeon, mm -hmm. right? Eagles have less competition. Mm -hmm. People think there's more competition the higher up you go, but actually there's less because you're yeah. not fighting for scraps. And, and this goes with anything, right? So if you can position yourself so that actually you can see, you can see the landscape, you can see the nonsense, you can see the division, you can see the fighting, you can see all the bickering, the people taking little snipes and stuff at each other, but you just stay above it, you stay on your game, you do what you do, and, you know, number one, you'll be happier and more peaceful. Um, you won't be oblivious to what's going on, you'll have full sight of it, but you're not going to be down there with the pigeons just, you know, fighting, fighting over scraps and, and breadcrumbs. So Lions don't care about the opinions of sheep, as they say, right? Yeah, that's the one. That's the one right there. Yeah. Rich, man, it's been a uh, it's been an honor to to speak to you. I'd love to have you on the podcast again sometime in the future. Um before we go, where can people find you online and is there anything you want them to check out? Um I would start at just the website. It's just richcooper.ca and it's it's got links there to everything from YouTube to my books to my social media to coaching, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for. So just start there. Awesome. Rich Cooper, thanks for coming on the show, bro. I appreciate you. Thanks, man.